please welcome to the stage, Anthea Rossow. Well, hello, Traverse City. Molo from South Africa. I'm so happy to be here today. I feel like Cinderella. Because you see, I've spent 26 years of my adult life in township kitchens across South Africa. So I truly feel like Cinderella today. And I'd very much like to share with you my journey. I'm known as the dream catcher in those communities. And I'd like to introduce you to that journey. I was born in the times of apartheid. And those were difficult, turbulent times. I was born to a father named Norman Sutherland Drake, whose predecessors were sent by Queen Victoria to settle in East London. And daddy spoke closer and taught us to speak closer long before we could speak any other language. So I was very fortunate until I was moved to a province in South Africa which was a bastion of apartheid. And then my life became very confused. Fast forward, I then settled in a beautiful resort town called Stillby in South Africa. And one day, a gentleman who was very ill with his friend came to see us and my husband could not help him because he was in heart failure, he couldn't work on his teeth. So I was given the car keys and said, take Moses home and give him this medication after. What happened was when he went to the car, he got in the back seat and William got in the other. So I said, what are you doing? He said, you're a white woman, right? And the dog sit in the front seat. We sit in the back seat. So I said, good gracious, no, come on, get up. And I took him home, I gave him the medication, gave him the team our instructions. And two weeks later, I got this call from a payphone. There was no cell phone in the community. And he said, listen, I haven't slept for two weeks. I look at the Southern Cross out of my window because that's right under the Southern Cross where we lived. And I could not forget that you were the first woman that is white that allowed me to ride in the front of your car and made me a cup of tea. You must be the dream catcher. And he said that to me in the African language. He knew nothing about a dream catcher. He had no way of knowing about the dream catcher up north. And so began my journey. For five years before apartheid was dismantled, I worked in the communities because what he showed me kept me awake for two weeks under the Southern Cross. The destitution, the poverty, one of the highest incidences of tuberculosis in the country, I could not live with myself. And my roots in East London, living and speaking closer, came back to me. And so I went on this journey with this community to help them for basic primary needs of food and trying to get shelter, helping to get money together to build a center where the physically challenged and the aging could go. And then we had the elections and apartheid was dismantled. And I thought, wow, this is the moment. And of course, of course, everybody in the community thought that the spy in the sky was literally going to fall down upon them. Well, fast forward another five years, and I realized that I was still in this circle. This circle of euphoria and hope now turning to expectations which are unmet. Disappointment, lack of recognition. The local people were jubilantly celebrated, celebrated the new South Africa, had no new South Africa. They were all looking towards Nelson Mandela's government for the pie in the sky, not recognizing that he had facilitated the transition to freedom politically, but that never meant economic freedom. And so when I realized this, and I saw the fear and resentment around me, I decided I have to do something. Because you see, there was opportunism abundance 
for everybody who was geared to go. But those who had to rise up, there were very few opportunities, and that's the majority of South Africa. There was intercultural diversity and intolerance. And so one day when all the people were lying on the beach by their thousands up the road, five kilometers away, I had an idea. What if I could use tourism as one of the biggest job creators in the world? We all travel, right? They were in their droves in the town up the road and coming into South Africa. Surely they must want to meet Mandela's people. Because that was what the boycotts were about, and the embargoes. It wasn't for the elephants and the lions. It was for the people, right? Well, that's what I thought. So I thought that the tour operators would absolutely roll out the new tour itineraries of South Africa. They would rewrite the typical package tour of the big five animals and include the best one of all, the people. Well, that never happened. And when I one day I was at a forum, I, I said, you know what, we need to put the people in. Well, I was absolutely hit by a barrage. I didn't know what hit me. So I developed my barriers, and I likened them to bones. In all the years I've been working in communities, I've found so many fat, rich bones. Those are the people that are wishing. They're always wishing for change to come, but they never, ever do anything more about that outside of benefiting themselves. And then you get the jaw bones. They talk all day long in meetings, but you don't get anything done. You recognize that person? And then you get these knuckle bones. They knocked everything I suggested on the table. We've been in tourism forever. It's not what people want coming here. They don't want to go to the people. They're scared. And then you get the funny bones. You know those little bones that you knock that's all painful? They laughed and laughed and laughed. And then there's the foot bones. They kicked my butt so much, I realized that I was not getting anywhere. I had to look for the backbones to help me to get under the job and get it done. Because so much going wrong at grassroots. And so I got this backbone. But I soon realized that a backbone is full of vertebrae. And each one is an individual part of that backbone. And if they don't work, those with us that suffer from back pain will understand that. So you need every one of the vertebrae. And they are bound together by the spinal cord of life. So I developed the ability to work with all those prior bones I told you about. And my dad said to me one day, you know what, you developed the ability to tell people to go to hell and look forward to the trip. <laughs> Which I actually did. I got those individual vertebrae to help me. I would go and help in the white community where I saw there was a need and the compassion was there. And then I would transfer that and those people to try to help me at grassroots. And then what happened is I developed this set. Now, if there's anybody out here hiring today, I guess I'm not going to make the short list because this is not really a curriculum. It was my survival kit to become change fit. So, then I decided that now it's time for a new beginning. I tried to find a tourism package and training that would help all the various cultures I was talking about and working about with. 84 cultures and 11 official languages in South Africa. And as I went along, everybody told me I was a nutter. And so, sometimes I believed it. Some of them call me that now. That's okay. Because then Alan Turing must be a nutter. Samuel Morse. And if it wasn't for Alexander Graham Bell, we would all be doing the following. So would some of you that are on this side say after me. Ngonyama. 
Bayeti. Well, that means in Zulu, that means there's a lion. And on that side, Bayeti is the royal hail. Hello. So the king wouldn't know that Ngonyama was on his way for, if it wasn't for Alexander Graham Bell. So I knew at that point I had to be a serious pioneer because I needed to teach people that they could become a service because 99% of the women all had been servants. They had no idea that the future lay in themselves. And so began a 10-year journey to break down these stereotypes, break down the barriers, find in themselves at community level the hospitality which they had shown to so many people in the struggle years. There was always room at the inn for someone that was on the run from the then government. So the idea hit me, it must be tourism. The biggest job creator in South Africa with potential to change poverty for many, many people. Nobody listened to me, ladies and gentlemen, none. So what happened? Homestay. I, I did it myself. I people that uh, this is a homestay. A homestay is not like a guest house or, or, or a hotel you, with all those fancy things. Right. It's just, it's just a home. Yeah. So that's why it's been called a, a, a homestay. Here in the homestay, we welcome the people that come to us and the people that we are getting, we, we are given by Dreamcatcher because we have been trained by Dreamcatcher from day one. From day one. That's Kamama Evelyn Swartboy. She's a Kosa. So it was fun for me because I could speak Kosa. So that is how. I developed in the different languages a basic hospitality program and pioneered it. I then took that program and that experience to the biggest tourism show in South Africa, where all the international buyers were coming from. I launched it with big fanfare and a lot of expense, and nobody booked. I then studied why, and I found that the tourism industry is very much linked to contracts. That meant that if you're sitting here, when you go to South Africa, you go through your agent here who is in contract to someone in South Africa who will take you where they want to take you. Now, if 99.99% of the tourism industry in South Africa is facilitated by folk that have been there for 1,500 years, there wasn't a chance because I was a lone worker at across the country in the communities. I never saw them there. So I questioned what I was doing. Maybe I was a nutter. And then one day, I said to one of my friends, listen, Mandisa, we need to go and do it ourselves. So we found money, I sold my car, I came to America. I knew that somewhere out there, I would find people that would support this, who knew the importance and the vital importance of people-to-people -people contact. Because I've never met anyone who has survived shaking a hand of a lion in South Africa. Yet that's the number one bucket list. And they weren't anywhere near when people were placing embargoes in South Africa. So I knew they had to, there was a disconnect. Landing in America, I changed my flight, departing from Logan Airport on September the 1st, 2001. I was to fly across to, um, on the plane that went down, uh, to talk at the airport at the uh, Meridian Hotel. I decided to change it and take Mandisa to the Martin Luther King Institute. She so badly wanted to do that. She wanted to see that freedom and the way that he walked to freedom. So we changed our flights. We flew down to Atlanta. I took her to the Martin Luther King Institute on the, 31st of, on the 1st of September. I left Atlanta that morning and I flew to Dallas. What followed was six days of being completely lost in America. I said, what now? Here I am, I've taken my last money. What am I gonna do? I'm a victim, no. All of a sudden, my upbringing said to me, and this beautiful woman taught me the survival skills, and I knew I would be a victor in, of 911. 
And so I, with the last money, I bought a train ticket, and I came across America, from Dallas to Little Rock, right across Detroit, I eventually landed in Chicago, the first train out of Dallas. And that, I made my way to Toronto, eventually back into New York City, one of the first flights to land. Going to Ground Zero, ladies and gentlemen, I must tell you, I've never told this story before. I realized as the ash fell on my shoulders, people need people. We need to engage. So I went back to South Africa and I renewed my vigor to work with intracultural network development and working with all the many different cultures. There are different cultures on that slide. I then put them together in peer-to-peer -to -peer knowledge support. So each culture would share what worked and what didn't work. And while they were all uniquely different, they were bound by a network of commonality. They wanted to feed their kids. They wanted their children to go to school. They were not happy. Their children were born long after apartheid was dismantled, and yet nothing had changed for them except political freedom. And so these ladies today are bound together in incredible tourism experiences called Homestays with Kamama, cook up with Kamama, everyone owning their own business, us just as a medium, myself and my colleagues. We then developed a volunteer program, because what now? I can't find anybody in the community of Stillby and up the road who had a car, who had the means, who, who surely wanted to do something for the people at Grassroots. No one came. What now? And so I remembered the gentleman on the train. When I was on my way, I had no more money. And he went and gave me a free cup of tea and a jello sandwich, peanut butter and jelly sandwich in Detroit on the train. He said, I've watched you. You haven't eaten for three days. So please have this. And so I developed a volunteer program, reached out to everybody in the world, and today we have an outcomes-based volunteer program, and everybody that comes must get their hands dirty. They must take off their shoes. I worked for 26 years without high heel shoes, but I am told I've got a 20-year-old pair of feet. I can take that. So you get your hands dirty and you work hard with us, and then you will change. We have worked on the health and wellness of the women and girls. 637,000 girls under the age of 16 got pregnant last year because they've got low self-esteem. They don't know where they're going to. The parents are wor working. They're trying to eke a living. And so we've developed an incredible program called Kick Up Kamamas. Kamamas contains key motivational messages which are merged with unique lifestyle, diversity, and nature and then merged once again with inspirational music and core body strengthening exercises. These all play a powerful role in transforming and empowering the lives of teenage girls and women across South Africa, and in fact, can be done anywhere else. Enjoy and grow. And so what is the impact? I'm running out of time, I have run out of time. The impact working with volunteers by the way, that DVD was co-sponsored by the Utopia Foundation, Traverse City. Thank you so much. <laughs> this is what can be done with visitors to the Kamamas in South Africa, by volunteers and visitors. That's the road now, that was then. This is the house now, that was then. Measuring impact is vital. So why is local impact vital? We, we can go come in and then you can see what I'm going to do. The, the cook up gamama, it's sort of a catering. I'm cooking the African traditional food with the guests. I'm going to cook the chakalaka yeah. and then I'm going to make the usenza dish. 
and then we can make the spinach together. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The Kamama is the African lady. This lady is doing everything, is carrying a baby at the back, is having a bucket of water on the head, and is carrying another baby on a hand. She's taking care of the family. This project means a lot to me because uh, when I met this lady of this project in Thierry to me, it was the bad days at that time because uh, at that time I was retrenched at work. And when I met this lady, she brings a light to me for my family. Today, I am someone that has been mentioned overseas. I have heard from a Danish girl that it should be amazing to, to stay in a, in a township in South Africa. And I think this is the place where you can really feel the African culture. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce you to the scores of Cook Up Kamamas and Homesteads Kamamas in South Africa. They're very proud to serve you. They can unfortunately not entertain you. They don't have tusks. They have hands to greet you. They will say, Inkoweni Molo, which means, hello, I'm the mother. We have fun. Every day we have fun. We bring happiness. We give children a reason because they know mothers taking them to work, taking them to school. They grow knowing it's real. And that is spreading happiness. And then there would be a better tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, I must leave you now. Cinderella's time is up. I'd like to throw a couple of hundred glass slippers at you and hoping that some prince or princess will pick it up and next time they consider to travel to South Africa, they say, what now? They might consider engaging local people. What is done here can be done anywhere in the world. Every woman and every child needs you in the communities across the world where there's socioeconomic hardship. Thank you. <laughs>